In the work we've done at, at Stanford Research Institute, we find that people are able to quiet their minds and look into the distance and look into the future and describe what's going on at these distant places. And the most important thing that we found is that this is a non-local ability. That is to say, the accuracy and reliability of psychic functioning is independent of space and time, and it's independent of the distance that it is no harder for me to describe what you're doing in Toronto than it is to describe what my wife is doing in the kitchen. The fact that you're 2,500 miles away does not at all impede the accuracy or reliability that I could describe the building you're in, for example. Similarly, it's no harder to describe what's going to occur in the future, at least days or, or hours or days in the future, than it is to describe something contemporaneous. And we've done numerous operational tasks. We worked for the CIA for our two decades at, at SRI. So the CIA would frequently come in and give us some task to do, but you're not interested in that, I'm sure. And welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. I want to, uh, as usual, remind the listener to please subscribe. Uh, if you haven't already, share with your family and friends and anybody uh, in your circle that you think might benefit from uh, the fun conversations that we're having here that are uh, just as exploratory as they are fun, actually. I, in fact, that's what makes them fun anyway. So let's get into today's, uh, uh, today's episode. Today's episode is with... Um, a guest that we have been uh, that we have been courting for the last couple of weeks, or maybe a week and a half. It seems like five years now because we've <laughs> had such lengthy conversations with him. His name is Russell Targ. He joins us uh, from California. Uh, Russell is a physicist and an author, and he is a pioneer in the development of the laser and laser applications, and a co-founder of the Stanford Research Institute, the SRI investigation of psychic abilities in the 1970s and the 1980s. SRI is a research and development think tank in Menlo Park, California. Called Remote Viewing, his work in the psychic area has been published in Nature, the Proceedings of the Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers, the IEEE, so the IEEE, and the Proceedings of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS. Targ has a bachelor's degree in physics from Queens College and did graduate work in physics at Columbia University. He has received two National Aeronautics and Space Administration Awards for inventions and contributions to lasers and laser communications. In 1983 and 1984, he accepted invitations to present remote viewing demonstrations and to address the USSR Academy of Science on this research. He is an author and co-author of nine books dealing with the scientific investigation of psychic abilities and Buddhist approaches to the transformation of consciousness, including Mind Reach, Scientists Look at uh, psychic ability uh, with uh, uh, with Hal Putoff, uh, Miracles of Mind, Exploring Non-Local Consciousness and Spiritual Healing, and Limitless Mind, A Guide to Remote Viewing and Transformation of Consciousness. He also wrote an autobiography, Do You See What I See? Memoirs of a Blind Biker in 2008, and his uh, current book, uh, in fact, his last book, uh, his most recent book, is The Reality of ESP, A Physicist Proof of Psychic Abilities. As a senior staff scientist at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, Targ developed airborne laser systems for the detection of wind shear and air turbulence. Having retired in 1998, he now writes books on psychic research and teaches remote viewing worldwide. His website is ESPresearch.com. Russell, welcome so much to the show. I'm very happy to be with you at last. All of these technical stumbles have been overcome. 
Uh, yes, and uh, you you have had uh, an immense amount of patience with us, so I, I I do really appreciate it. And over the span of a few days too, so this is not just uh, this is not just today. Um, but we're finally here. We had been reaching out to you uh, over the last several weeks. We finally sent uh, a last salvo out, and uh, we sent that out. And we sent it out the same day that we released a podcast that was entitled turning away from the motorcycle. And I realized after I sent that email, I said, Oh, oh he's a motorcycle aficionado and <laughs> he's going to check us out. And the first, the first thing he's going to see is turning away from the motorcycle. This might really turn him off forever. <laughs> but that day you responded, which is amazing. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't know what that was. Uh, but you, you must have viewed something. Well, I received only that one communication. I mean, I'm easy to find. If you go to my website, there's a little chat box. So if you go to ESP Research, mm-hmm. it says write something here if you want to talk to Russell. So I'm not hiding. So what are you telling me? That we, we, we worked for nothing? All we needed to do was go to your website? You you might get a lot of requests now after uh, after these listeners go through this. No, I'm just disappointed that you had a struggle to find me because I had hoped that I was in public domain. Well, yeah, certainly we we found that out later how uh, how easy it is uh, uh, to reach you. But uh, again, talking about disappointment, uh, I, I think I've disappointed you enough for the last couple of days. So hopefully we can hopefully I can redeem myself. Well, you're in a, you're in another country, so I have to. That has to be taken into account. Oh, you're so kind, so kind. Uh, one of one of the first times we spoke, actually, um, sorry, uh, after the first time we spoke, you you told me that you uh, listened to uh, our episode uh, sixty seven with Federico Fagin, and then I asked you why, uh, because I thought it'd be a perfect fit through uh, for uh, the this is the kind of conversation that you and I are going to be having, and you said that you actually spent a month at his house in Northern Italy. That's right. Federico's a good friend of mine and a neighbor. As I live in Palo Alto, he lives in Los Altos foothills, which is just a couple of miles from me. And I had an opportunity to do a pair of workshops in Italy, in Milan, actually. And But I had a month downtime, and I mentioned that to him. Uh, we, we we go to a mutual meeting called FMBR Foundation for Mind Being Research, and I was just uh, mentioning that I'm going to Italy and I have this odd thing I don't know what I'm going to do for a month. And he said, "Well, why don't you stay at my house? Because my house is very near Milan, and you'd find that very congenial." And I did. It was lovely, lovely community, lovely big town, and he has a luxurious home where I was happy to stay for a month. So let's get right into it. In your, in your autobiography, and in also in one of the conversations, one of the first conversations you and I had, uh, you said, we misunderstand the nature of the space time we live in. What does that mean? Well, ma- many years ago, um, Wittgenstein wrote that if we're going to understand the nature of human beings in space time, we have to look outside of space and time. And what he meant by that is that there's more to space time than the three spatial dimensions we see. That is, we, we see space, three spatial dimensions that we're familiar with, and the time dimension that Einstein and Minkowski brought in to explain special relativity, those give you four dimensions of which one is complex. The time dimension is a complex dimension, meaning it contains a square root of minus one in the characterization of that dimension. In the work we've done at at Stanford Research Institute, we find that people are able to quiet their minds and look into the distance and look into the future and describe what's going on at these distant places. And the most important thing that we found is that this is a non-local ability. That is to say, the accuracy and reliability of psychic functioning is independent of space and time, and it's independent of the distance 
that it is no harder for me to describe what you're doing in Toronto than it is to describe what my wife is doing in the kitchen. The fact that you're 2,500 miles away does not at all impede the accuracy or reliability that I could describe the building you're in, for example. Similarly, it's no harder to describe what's going to occur in the future, at least days or, or hours or days in the future, than it is to describe something contemporaneous. And we've done numerous operational tasks. We worked for the CIA for our two decades at, at SRI. So the CIA would frequently come in and give us some task to do, but you're not interested in that, I'm sure. But we did get a lot of publicity when we were using our precognitive abilities to forecast the community, the commodity, silver commodity market. So we could sit in my kitchen and go through a protocol that would allow the psychic sitting with me to describe whether silver would go up a little, up a lot, down a little, or down a lot at the end of the week. So we did nine trials forecasting the direction and the amount of the change in the silver market. And we did that for nine weeks. And all nine of our forecasts were correct. And we made a quarter million dollars forecasting silver using psychic abilities and you should re realize that all of those forecasts were into the future. I would ask my psychic to describe the object I'm going to put in his hand. You see, it would be nice if I could say, please take a look at the commodity exchange, look at the big board in New York, and see what silver will be doing on Friday. And what has it gone up or has it gone down? But that's an analytical task. And we know that remote viewing and psychic functioning is a non-analytical ability. Very, very rare will a person be able to read something. So we have to way of find a way to trick psychic abilities so you can get the analytical information you need without having the person do analysis. And Stephen Schwartz was the first to enunciate how to do that. Schwartz runs the Mobius Foundation, and he and I have been friends for decades. This, so Stephen wrote the forward in the, in the latest book that you wrote the, about ESP uh, and how we all have abilities in ESP. I, I remember, so I want to go back to those names, uh, Russell. I'm sorry to interrupt because you've said a lot here, and I, I want to break it down a little bit because it's, it's incredibly interesting. Let's go back um, to the late 60s or at least the 60s. So you you started off as a physicist, uh, professionally speaking, and you were pioneering in uh, laser production. Can I say that? Or laser research, laser development. The, the fellow who holds the laser patent hired me out of graduate school. I, I knew how to make electrical discharges in gases, and he was making a gas laser. So I had skill that would be useful to Gordon uh, to work on the first laser. So he hired me to work with him at a company called TRG in Long Island. We made some lasers, some interesting ones. We did not make the first laser. But you were you were pioneers in the development of the, the charge of the laser. I, I'm probably using the wrong terminology. Uh, but how did you move from uh, working as a physicist out of graduate school on laser production to working with and for uh, the CIA specifically for rem remote viewing research? Well, that's a long story. When I was in high school, I was already very interested in psychic functioning. And I remember once being on stage describing the research that's going on in America and in Soviet Union, I must have been 15 years old. This is my last year of high school. And I remember being on the stage and saying, this is th thinking to myself, this is very interesting work. But I know from the meetings that I've gone to of the Parapsychological Association, that there are a lot of people doing work in this field and they're all poor. They're unappreciated college professors. They're not even professors. 
But doing ESP research is not a viable way to earn a living. I see, I grew up in the Depression. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1934, and we had no dough during those early years. Eventually, um, we moved to New York. My father became vice president of a big publishing company, and then we had some dough. Yep. But I was, I was aware that it's not fun to live having no money. And I was not going to start my career as being an impoverished ESP researcher. So I had the idea that if I could become an expert in some other field, mm -hmm. then I could segue into ESP research. And that's what I did. So I did ESP research from 1958 to 1972. By 1972, I was very well known as a laser pioneer. I had built a thousand watt carbon dioxide laser, which was the most powerful laser in the world at its time. And I had done work for the CIA and for NASA. So I thought this is a good time to try and set up an ESP laboratory. And coincidentally, I met my colleague, Hal Putoff, who worked at SRI, and I told him that I often gave talks just like the one he is giving here about Soviet American research, and I had been invited to attend a conference on speculative technology in May of 1972. It's a long sequence of events, which I won't tell you about. There's just a cha chain of unlikely events that got me in a church lecturing on ESP, and a NASA administrator heard my lecture and invited me to come to the Conference on Speculative Technology. And I went there with my ESP teaching machine that I had built as a four-choice ESP teaching machine. On the side. You built this on the side. As you were yeah. <laughs> working as a physicist in laser in laser development. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so at this conference, I was talk. I lectured to them about uh, what we know about ESP, uh, what's been done in America, what's been done in the Soviet Union, and that I have the idea that I would like to take my ESP game or something like it. Other ESP teaching machines were hot in the early seventies. And Von Braun was Werner Von Braun was at this conference. Uh, so I showed this four choice electronic machine at Werner Von Braun, and he did very, very well. He was extremely successful. He got all the way up to useful at Las Vegas, which is one of the higher stamps you can get on the machine. Mm -hmm. So he took me to meet the administrator of NASA, James Fletcher. Mm -hmm. So Von Braun took me to the top guy and said, uh, Targ has built a number of lasers for NASA, and he now has this idea that he wants to teach astronauts to become psychic so they can become in touch with their spacecraft. Amazing. And he wants $80,000 <laughs> to have this, he uses teaching machines <laughs> to teach astronauts to be psychic. <laughs> He, he was really rooting for you. Eh? That's right. <laughs> what a friend. And, and, and Fletcher said, I think we can do that. See, I wow. used to be an enthusiastic science fiction reader. And Isaac Asimov wrote the Foundation series. Mm -hmm. And my hero in that group, in that collection of books, was the mayor of, of, of a town. And he, and he was a semanticist. He said, nothing has to be true. A thing just has to sound true. So I was very skillful <laughs> at doing stuff like that. So I gave a good pitch to Von Brown and a good pitch to um, Jim Fletcher. And Von Brown agreed. They would agree to support us. And I met, and I met uh, Edgar Mitchell there. Edgar so Mitchell, I, who was an, an astronaut and then founded a school of noetic, noetic science. Uh, so Edgar Mitchell. Uh, went to NASA with me, together with a NASA administrator. Wow. And Hal Putoff, my colleague, and we all piled into the office of the president, Charlie Anderson, 
And so NASA has agreed to give me some money. Can we create a program here? Hal and I are both very, Hal was a PhD physicist from Stanford and written a book, <clears throat> very well-known book on um, quantum optics. So we were natural colleagues outside of ESP. So we, we, were, we were known in the laser field. So Charlie Anderson said that we would probably not be an embarrassment if we kept a low profile. Right. Hal, Hal and I, together with my ADK from NASA, could start a program at SRI. What's amazing is uh, not your story, not the story that was told to sell NASA, it's the fact that NASA agreed to have you research based on what you told them. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the big story, right? I mean, I say big story, but that's, that's the big deal is that psychic abilities to, to train astronauts to have psychic abilities was a story that triggered them to invest their time and energy. in Well, it was a coincidence that Von Braun did very well with my ESP machine and he testified that the machine sort of worked. Sure. Uh, he picked up my machine and kept ringing the bell, which means you got the, you hit the correct picture. And he told me about it. So everybody's got a psychic grandmother throughout the government. Nobody will admit to being psychic, but everybody's got a psychic grandmother. Well, it, okay. So I want to, I want to pepper this with a, a little bit of something. You have a video uh, that you gave in 2015 or 16 that was on YouTube for a while, hit 7 million hits or 8 million hits or something, and then was deemed too controversial and was kicked off YouTube, but it's on Vimeo. So if you just Google your name video, it'll come up. It's easy. And then obviously you can go to your website and you'll see it. But in, in that you started off, <laughs> start with a little bit of humor, which is what I, I, it's uh, obviously attracted me to the talk. And you said, um, uh, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, you said ESP or psychic abilities is not anything spiritual. It's not about eating porridge at the feet of your guru. <laughs> <laughs> that it's something that's innate in everybody, uh, which really, I mean, your, your humor caught me. That was the hook. But when you say it's innate in everybody, how, how do you know that? Because I spent uh, the past four decades teaching people how to do remote viewing. My job at SRI, we had a division of labor at SRI, Hell dealt with all the spooky people who were supporting us now. NASA, CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, the FBI, so forth. How had been a intelligence officer in the Navy. <clears throat> so he felt very happy and comfortable dealing with all these spooky people. And you, my you job- just wanted to do the research. That's right. Hmm. My job was to sit in the dark <clears throat> with the <laughs> psychic of the day who might be somebody we were working with extensively, or it might be the Undersecretary of Defense or the Administrator of NASA or some other high-level government or a gen Army general. And they would come to SRI, and the story is, yes, we're thinking about supporting your work. Can you show us something psychic? And what they, what they believe is about to happen is that I will produce Ingo Swan, who's a artists and started our program, or Pat Price, who was a psychic police commissioner, or Hella Hammond, who was a psychic uh, photographer. And they thought that one of those distinguished uh, performers would show up and do something psychic. And I said, I could do that. But in my experience, if I show you something psychic by having Ingo Swan do it, you will then go back to Washington and figure out that it was some kind of trick that uh, we told him you know, where we we're going. Right. But instead, I'm going to sit here with you and your major, your colleague will go with Hal. You'll randomly choose a place from in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. You'll choose a card and that will be your driving instructions. And you will your buddy, your adjutant will go somewhere with Hal 
and I have no idea where that might be. But while they're there, someplace around three o'clock this afternoon, you, I will guide you to describe your experience with regard to where they are. So he, he would, of course, say, I don't even believe in that stuff. And I would say to return to where we were, you don't have to believe in it. If you will just do what I'm telling you to do, the images will appear in your awareness. This is really very simple. You hardly have to do anything at all. I'm going to say at three o'clock, um, your major in hell or somewhere in the Bay Area, close your eyes and tell me about the surprising images that show up in your awareness. In a certain sense, since you're the only one who knows that, you can't really do this wrong. All I want you to do is tell me what they're experiencing that's new and make a drawing of that. And that's been my shibboleth for 20 years, for the magic words that I say to allow somebody to make use of their psychic ability. I make it clear that this is not a test. I'm not looking to see if you're psychic. I know you're psychic. And I'm guiding you to the best of my ability to manifest that ability. You said to me at the, the, our first conversation, you said uh, half jokingly, or maybe not. You said spiritual development was paid for by the U.S. government. And I stayed in a dark room for 10 years teaching people how to remote view. <laughs> That's all true. I sat in the dark for a decade. CIA paid for that activity. And in that period of time, I got the idea that uh, there's more to us than meat, more, more, more to us than meat and potatoes. The idea that if you think that who you are is what you see in the mirror in the morning, then you're in for a lot of suffering. So, who are we in the morning when we look in the mirror? Who are we? Well, the Buddhists would have you spend a lot of time meditating to come to the experience of who you are. The Dzogchen Buddhism is a type of Buddhism that was perfected by the guy over my shoulder here, who you can see, but the other phone listeners can't see. That's Padma Sabhava. Mm -hmm. In the 8th century, he was a well-known Indian, Indian Buddhist, and he was invited to Tibet to help with internecine wars that were going on over religion. And... Padmasambhava was a very powerful meditator and probably magician as well. And he taught people that their nature is timeless awareness. That is, if you quiet your mind, you are able to naturally move your awareness, your point of view, beyond space and beyond time. And what that means is that because your consciousness is outside of time, your activities are not limited by cause and effect. He understood all that in the 8th century. That sounds like modern physics. Mm -hmm. But um, Zoshin Buddhism basically moves you from uh, ego-based craving and fear. The, Buddhism is not a religion, which you may know. Yep. Buddhism gives you tools to move from the desire and fear that goes with craving principally stuff and the fear that goes with the feelings that you're not going to get enough stuff. So craving and fear is a cause of suffering. And that would that seem not controversial. Mm -hmm. And Dzogchen Buddhism is a fast track for moving out of this craving and fear into timeless awareness and freedom. Timeless awareness is the experience that you're not limited to the feelings you're having as you lie in bed worrying about tomorrow. You become aware that you don't have to worry about tomorrow. You can just move your awareness from where you are out into the spacious realms to experience that timeless awareness and freedom. It's available. It's no charge. You don't have to pay anybody. You don't have to eat porridge and feed your guru. It's available. When you say those realms, the spacious realms, what, uh, what do you mean? Give me an example. Carl Jung described in Dreams, Memories, and Reflections, 
he had a out of body experience in meditation mm -hmm. where he moved out into the universe past the moon so he could look back at the earth and see the moon and see the earth and it gave him a new picture of what he's able to do what his consciousness is capable of and um another way another form of freedom uh, i'm going to read something about dreaming so on this podcast we talk we talk about dreaming as well, uh, not in every episode, but with uh, select guests who are open to, to discussing it. So this is something that we also explore. So you, in, in your autobiography, uh, page 233, actually, there's a, a, an excerpt on, on dreaming. And this is, what, this is what you wrote. You talk about a certain uh, goings on in, uh, in your life. Uh, earlier on, you said the important thread running through all these examples that you had mentioned before is that awareness persists and that our minds are powerful and non-local. And above all, we are more than just a body. Our memories and our present thoughts affect the thoughts and experiences of ourselves and others now and in the future. Our memories, emotions, and intentions create information that can be accessed in non-ordinary states of awareness, such as dreams and remote viewing. In, in your experience, is, are they the same, remote viewing and dreaming? Are they accessing a reality that uh, we're not seeing when we're looking at ourselves in the mirror in the morning? Well, there's a third element there. There's dreams, there's remote viewing, and there's lucid dreams. Okay. Now, in remote viewing, you're quieting your mind. You're quite conscious. In order to do remote viewing, you have to make use of some analytical ability. So I will tell you in remote viewing, what shows up in your awareness, don't name it, just draw a wiggle, and you draw some kind of shape or form. And I'll say, well, that's terrific. Just write that down. Then look again, what else comes to view? And something else will come to view. And I say, well, we're talking about an object. So if you hold this in your hand, does this have weight? Uh, can you tell me what it might be made of? Are uh, any colors come to view? So I'm steering you at the third episode into sort of analytical perceptions. So you're, you're, you're not dreaming, you're doing what I tell you to do. Mm -hmm. In a dream, in general, or in, in my dreams, uh, I don't have a lot of control. I dream and strange stuff happens, and it may or may not come together as what I think of as a precognitive dream. So if I have a clear, bizarre dream that is not made of wish fulfillment or anxiety, or the previous day's residue is free of residue, free of anxiety, but it's a clear, bizarre dream about something, then I will tell my wife about it with the idea that this is probably a precognitive dream because it does not, does not have a source of the usual forms of dreams, which is anxiety, previous day's residue, mm -hmm. so forth. And in due course, I expect that to come to pass, and it usually does. So I, I have many precognitive dreams. And the only way I can say it's precognitive, in order to get credit for a precognitive dream in the big book, you've got to write it down or tell somebody before it occurs. Sure. And you better not have very many of these things that don't occur. If you tell, if you relate every goofy dream you have, and only one or two comes true, they have no credibility. They'll take away your Oracle license. <laughs> but if you generally um, come up with dreams, which then manifest that day, then, you, then it's a clear precognitive dream. For example, a recent dream I had, I used to go to Esalen Institute where I would lecture for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And there's a big house there. <clears throat> At the end of the week, all of the lecturers would get together and you'd have a round, round 
round circle where you would sit. And that's a very nice way to spend a day chatting with all these other luminaries. And I like to do that. But I hadn't been there for a long, long time. I hadn't thought about Esalen. And I had this dream where they were having a meeting there. All the, round, all the people got together at the round table. And I was at the foot of the bridge. And I couldn't cross the river because I didn't have enough money. I couldn't afford to go to Esalen which in fact has gotten pretty expensive. So there's some anxiety there. Mm -hmm. But the dream was so realistic that I would take a, I took a chance and related just what I've told you. I was at Esalen. The whole gang had gotten together, sitting in their circle, and I wanted to be there. That was the dream. So I told my wife, got a cup of coffee. Next thing I do is go to my computer, where I am right now, and see what mail I have. And on top of my list was a letter, an email from uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who's a professor, may have even, you may have even interviewed him. Not yet. He's a professor of religion at Rice University. And I opened the letter he sent to me. And he said, I finally put together the film I've been working on. And here are the, here's the coming attraction. Coming attraction opens up with a circle of people at Esalen. And there I am in the circle with all my friends. Simply speaking, you, you, you're relating, you're relating something that is not, um, it's not, this occurrence is not new to me. And I don't think it's new to many people, mostly because I grew up with somebody who was very open to these experiences. And so it, it would happen often. And that was, that was my mom. So my, my mom would have these pre-cognitive pre dreams. And they're actually pretty spooky because they were, they were dead on. When I say dead on, sometimes they involve death. <laughs> um, but I, I always dismissed it when I was younger. And uh, now I, I dismiss them much less. And I, I've become open to the idea that, you know, maybe, maybe there is something here. And, and this, is, this is one of the, this I guess is uh, an impetus to why we reached out to you because they're, we, we have an openness here uh, and inspire to have these discussions with folks like you. Uh, and in that you had offered, you had offered to do a quick remote viewing session on our last video call, our last two video calls, actually. And uh, we did it. And I found it <laughs> a play on words, eye opening. Um, Cause there was a level of success there that was uh, striking, striking. Uh, and uh, it led to more confusion, personally, uh, and excitement at the same time. Well, it gives you the idea that this is not an esoteric pursuit, that any, anyone who sits down quietly and is given a few guiding instructions can learn to do this swiftly. I am convinced of this now, now that you say this to me again, uh, after going through that small session the last time, I'm very convinced of it. I mean, uh, there, there wasn't anything to it. Uh, it was a few minutes and then <laughs> it just, things happen. Um, I mean, it's an ability. It's, an ability. Like, it's like teaching somebody to ride a unicycle. I mean, it was, he's someone on a unicycle that appears to be impossible. That the physics says you can't ride a unicycle. <laughs> You don't teach a person how to ride a unicycle. You just put them on them and hold them up for a while, and they pedal away if they're if they have the talent. My my, my little four year old, five year old daughter Elizabeth had a exquisite sense of balance. As a little child, I take her to the park, and for entertainment, she would walk on the top of the post supporting a chain link fence around the playground. That, that, that was her, her entertainment. So she had a very, very good sense of balance. So she was going to a private school in the Bay Area, and she would just ride her unicycle from our house to the bus stop and just take the unicycle on the bus so cool. to school. You've spoken to me about your about your kids uh, and your daughter as well. Your uh, your daughter was like you uh, entered college at a very young age, uh, so finished high school obviously early. And she she was also very good with your ESP machine. So you'd bring her to the lab and you and you try her abilities as well. And you said that she was extremely bright, and she became a, a, a psychiatrist. Yes, uh, and she studied 
I'm not going to say phenomenon, but uh, uh, parallel uh, abilities. So she was a parapsychologist. She, yeah. she was interested in distant healing. Distant healing. She, mm -hmm. she felt that she, she could round up the cooperation of distant healers to help her AIDS patients who are suffering. So she did double blind trials with the AIDS patients where 30 of them would receive healing from a number of distant healers, uh, Christians and American Indians and energy healers, all sorts of people did healing. And the 30 of her patients who received distant healing had much better outcomes in the controls. And that was published in the Western Medical Journal. Uh, and she she ended up passing away in, uh, when she was 40 uh, from uh, from the same sort of thing that she was trying to help heal in her patients. That's right. Subsequently, she was trying to help heal people from glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. And she succumbed to that disease. You had an experience with your former wife who also passed away after your daughter passed. And she you had a communication from her. You've confused uh, a, a number of things. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, my <clears throat> writing partner, Jane Catra, is a PhD in medical uh, um, something, education. Mm -hmm. She's not a doctor, but she's a, in medical something or other. Yep. And she wanted to get a job at Duke University. And in the course of the interview at Duke, was with a physician who ran the department and his nurse, who was also a professor. The nurse said, uh, I wouldn't normally say this, but somebody is really trying hard to get in touch with you, Jane. This woman says that she died recently. Do you know a woman who died recently with long, dark hair, tall woman? And Jane said, yes, I do. <clears throat> that was the um, daughter of my partner, Elizabeth Targ. And the nurse said, well, she wants to give you a message to give to her father and tell her father that she still remembers the trauma in early life when he and his wife stuffed me into a red dress. I was about two years old, and they demanded I wear that red dress, and they stuffed me very violently into that red dress. And that's been a trauma for me all my life. If you tell him that, he will know that my consciousness has survived. <clears throat> and that was all true. It was an example where no one else knew about it. Um, that is no, no living person knew about that adventure and bad child rearing. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you again for, for sharing that on the record. I thought that was important, uh, important to share. And I'm, I'm looking at actually a picture of your daughter. I had, I had your autobiography open to the page uh, where you, uh, you go over your daughter's, um, uh, your daughter's experience. So it's actually she's inadvertently just looking at us here while you're, you're speaking about her. You also have two kids, uh, sorry, sorry, two sons. So two other kids. Uh, I didn't know this. You're you're a tall man. You're you're six foot five, as per your autobiography. Here, your your sons are taller. Yes. My, um, my my son Nicholas, the attorney, is six foot eight. And that that son was the one who was able to then have your research with the CIA finally declassified only a few years ago. That's right. He wrote to Amazing. the CIA. He wrote to the CIA with the help of our local congressman. Amazing. Saying. Um, this work is now 20 years old. We think it should be declassified or we'll go to court with you and you can tell the court why you think it should not be classified. Why, and why it should not be declassified. And the CIA said, okay, we'll, set, we'll send you the stuff. And a couple of months later, I got a box full of uh, previously secret documents that are all declassified so I can tell you about this now. Sure, sure. It's, I'm able, I, and, and I'm grateful to. I'm grateful to your son as well. This is, it's beyond fascinating. 
so go, let's let's go back uh, again, if you don't mind, to the '70s. So when you're thick in the middle of your research uh, at the SRI uh, and Stanford, uh, working exclusively for the uh, CIA and doing the research for the CIA, not anything operative, you you had let me know, and I read about it, and it's also in your documentary, uh, and we'll mention your documentary at the end as well, the Third Eye Spies. Um, that you were taught to remote view by Ingo Swan, who is a famous uh, psychic. And you, in turn, you and Hala Hamid, uh, in turn, taught everybody else. And everybody else included hand-picked army officers. That's right. About six years into the program, we had been doing operational remote viewing for army intelligence but they were embarrassed to come to California and have a California psychic tell us where the Russian submarine is or where the what's going on at the atomic bomb factory or what the Chinese are doing. They wanted to, couldn't I train up a bunch of people to create a psychic army, a army psychic corps? And Hal and I, my colleague Hal and I went to a big gymnasium where they had 30 people sitting around on the floor who had agreed to put their career in jeopardy and learn remote viewing in California. And we chose six of those people and five of them turned out to be prodigious remote viewers. So the series of trials I did with these <clears throat> six guys off the floor was significant at one in a million. One of them is, his name is, uh, he's still around, Joe McGonagall. Joe McManagall. McManagall, sorry. Um, and he, you, He's as good a remote viewer as any of the stars who were resident with us. Uh, uh, give us an example of what uh, he was able to see or able to locate as an example. Just well, his, example. Very, his very first trial with me, uh, he and I were sitting in the dark room, and I showed him the moves that were, told him what we're going to do. And his major had gone someplace with Hal Putoff. And I said, well, they're at their place now. And he said, well, I see this and I see that and I see something else and I see something else. And I said, well, that's going to be very confusing for a judge who's going to have to eventually decide where you think they are. Can you just choose one of those drawings and make a more detailed version of that. See, I, I don't know the answer. See, I am I can say anything I want to to help my viewer because I don't know where they've gone or where they might have gone. I, I don't I'm as blind as the viewer. So I can help him get into the frame of doing remote viewing because I have no information to give him apart from the uh, structural information. So he redrew his thing. He drew a uh, long, low building <clears throat> with pillars in front. And he said, I see this building looks like piano keys, five or six um, pillars in front of it and a fountain off to the side. And it turned out that they had gone to the Stanford University Art Museum and came back with a photograph that very greatly resembled what Joe had drawn. And that was his very first number one remote viewing. There was also another, an, another story where he, he identified the construction of the world's largest submarine that hadn't been launched at that point, a, a Russian submarine in a warehouse. Do I have the details? That's right. right. This was a 300 foot submarine. Uh, he was targeted. So this, this is the next year we had set up the, uh, Psychic Army Corps at Fort Meade. Joe was one of the prominent viewers there. And he was asked to describe what's, what, what are they building in this huge uh, building quarter mile from the Arctic Ocean. And Joe said, Joe said, I see the welding and lots of sparks welding. They're putting, looks like, Two submarine hulls being welded together, the enormous wide 300 foot, the biggest submarine I've ever heard. And indeed, it was the was a 
the biggest submarine in the world at that time. Not to prompt you to give a, another another story, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Going back to Ingo Swan, um, he had seen ice crystals around Jupiter before it was scientifically proven. Is, am I right in saying that? Dean Radin. Dean Radin promulgated the idea that consciousness permeates everything, which is to say that you can see the large and you can see the small. So our contract monitor was in my laboratory one time over building the ESP teaching machine for NASA. And he said, by the way, we're sending a Pioneer spacecraft to Jupiter, Ingo, who was there. Can you tell me anything that we'll find that will be surprising in Jupiter that we didn't know about? And Ingo, Ingo pulled out his drawing pen and filled the page with celestial drawings and said, basically, when they get there, they will find that there's a circular ring of ice crystals, a circular ring of ice crystals. And George said, you, are you sure you're not looking at Saturn? And Ingo said, I've been looking at the solar system my entire life. I know the difference between Saturn and Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter has this one large crystal around it, whereas Saturn has a whole group of flat crystals or dust. And when you get to Jupiter, you will see this and send me a picture. And indeed, seven months later, they got to Jupiter and they found the uh, ice crystal that Ingo had seen. And the point is that this is 500 million miles away and takes. That is the uh, point. <laughs> 500 million miles away. And it takes 30 light minutes to get information from there. So Ingo turns his head and Jupiter fills his attention. And either Jupiter is always in his mind, evidently, or we would have had to wait half an hour for a picture of Jupiter to arrive at Ingo. So we would say that <clears throat> what we saw is it doesn't take any time for him to get to Jupiter at all. You just turn on Jupiter and there it is. So we think that we live in a universe where there, <clears throat> where all the points in space time are connected with one another. That is, you have a universe filled with distant events, and all of those events are occurring at different places and at different time. But if we live in a universe where those spaces and times are connected because they're living in a complex space-time, so that each of those dimensions, in addition to having a real part, like it's a thousand miles from here to there, and there's also a certain time to get from here to there, if those times and those spaces are actually <clears throat> complex numbers, then there will always be a path, some x squared plus y squared equal the distance, and that will sometimes add to zero. So we, we believe that we live in a complex space-time where you have four real parts and four imaginary parts, and there will always be a way of adding real parts to imaginary parts to add to zero. So Ingo could close his eyes and find the path from him to Jupiter. And I should say, there are infinitely many such paths through space-time. So you didn't have to look very hard. Well, you, you use the word tugging uh, to describe what the future is doing in, uh, in your book as well. If, if you don't mind me reading this, because uh, I, I thought th this would be a great addition to what you've just, what you've just described. Um, if you don't mind, I, I'll read it just, for, just for a moment. Uh, you, again, Oh, on page 234, so the same, same chapter as the last that I read from. You said, the cases I have described in this chapter, taken together with the precognition experiments described previously, offer strong evidence that we, we each stand at the center of a vast personal coordinate system like a spider web. 
and this is not, this is, these are my comments. This is not any different to, to what ancient indigenous tribes all around the world had believed to begin with. Uh, but anyway, those are, those are my thoughts. Uh, and to continue, uh, like a coordinate system, like a spider web in which we can see in all directions and remember both the past and the future because it keeps tugging on us. The future in particular keeps tugging to become realized. As we learn to participate in this expanded awareness of space and time, past and future, we create the opportunity to experience the transcendence described by the world's mystics. And one of those mystics spoke of Indra's web. I don't know if Indra's web made it to my book. Indra's web is a Hindu idea where there was a, a web of crystals and you could stand and look at any look into any crystal and see all the other crystals because all the other each crystal is a mirror and is part of the web and they and this was i mean there's a this dogma in buddhism from the prajnaparamita um 500 years before christ where the buddha talks about the idea for there is no separation for consciousness, and that's because uh, co consciousness manifests throughout space time. So this is uh, this is not new age. This is believed for twenty five hundred years. And you mentioned Indra. Indra meaning uh, misspelled I N D R E. Do you remember the spelling? I don't know. I would I N D R A. I would have guessed. I N D R A. So we had uh, we had um, a guest on the podcast uh, a few weeks back. Her name is Indre. She's of Lithuanian descent. I N D R E. Also lives in California, and we talked about the origins of her name, and it comes from Sanskrit. So yes. the origins are the same. And what did I find out in my research on some of her work? She's a neuroscientist and, op and an opera singer is that she did a short series on the Oprah Winfrey network uh, where she invest, she was a, a quote unquote detective uh, and w w spoke to people with psychic abilities. And one of these, uh, her name was Pat, I'm going to say Cormorant, but uh, something like that. And she was a remote viewer. And Indra was very, very skeptical. So, but yeah, you know, we talked about it very, uh, very briefly on the podcast. And I thought, I thought while I was speaking to her about remote viewing, I reminded myself, oh yeah, we got to reach out to, to Russell. This is crazy. How can we not talk about Russell now? How can we not talk to Russell now? And so here we go. You mentioned Indra and go figure. I, it, it, there's no coincidences, right? I, I've never believed in coincidences. Yeah, I don't know if it's called Indra's net or Indra's web. I will look that up. I will look that but up. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of Hindu doctrine. So consciousness, consciousness goes out to uh, Jupiter 500 million miles away. But before that happened, uh, Madame Blavatsky, Helena Blavatsky, had created the Theosophical Society in, 19, in 1885 to explore the mysteries of the universe and the unexplored uh, capabilities of mankind, the hidden capabilities of mankind. So she was not a, a deist. The Theosophical Society, like Buddhism, is not really a, a religion, mm -hmm. but is a f philosophical thing that uh, invites you to move in, again, move into the spacious realms. And in 1895 in England, where I don't know whether she was in England, in England or in India at that point, but she wanted to create a psychic periodic table. The periodic table had just been created, periodic table of the elements. So she asked her two prodigious psychics, Eddie Besant and Charles Leadbeater, uh, to get a, get some paraffin, because somehow she knew there was a lot of hydrogen in paraffin. In fact, par paraffin has the atomic formula that's something like uh, C1H50. So 
every 50. You understand they're there for, 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 Adam, for every hydro, for every carbon molecule in paraffin, there'll be 50 molecules of hydrogen. So she knew that hydrogen was a good. She knew that somehow she knew there, there are a couple of distinguished physicists. Well, in my time, there were a couple of distinguished physicists who were part of the New York Theosophical Society to which I belonged. But there must have been somebody whispering in her ear that if you want to find hydrogen, uh, paraffin is a good place to look. So they got a block of paraffin, and Annie Besson sat in front of that looking for hydrogen atoms. And you just can visualize this rectangular block of sticky stuff. And this woman is looking at it, looking for hydrogen. And what she saw is an array of triangles. And those triangles were, had a ball at each of the vertices. And those balls were connected together by bands of energy that held the balls together. And she drew that. And those balls were, she called, fundamental atomic masses. And the, ener and the bands of energy, she just called bands of energy. And she, drew, she made drawings of that and showed how they fastened together and published that all in Lucifer magazine, which is the magazine of the Theosophical Society. And she published that in 1895. And in my book, which you've been so kind to read, mm -hmm. the picture that Annie Besson drew showing the triangles toward the end of the toward the end of the book. And 75 short years later, Freeman Dyson at Princeton said the protons are really not fundamental masses, but protons are actually created by the constellation of three uh, quarks. And those quarks are connected together by gluons. So a proton is really made up of three quarks held in triangular formation by the gluons. The quarks are charged and the gluons are necessary to hold them together. So, 70, it took 75 years to move from Annie Besson's fundamental atom blocks of fundamental forms of matter to knowing that they really are, they're really quarks and gluons. Actually, a proton is made of two up quarks and two and a down quark. And that's the and those have no structure. I don't think. I don't think that we have that now that was 1965. So it's 70 um, years later. 70 years later. And and, and no and nobody has found quarks coming apart. So those, those seem to be fundamental atoms. And the point of the story is that Annie Besson was able to quiet her mind and see quarks which are 10 to the minus 10 centimeters in diameter, uh, infinitesimal, super infinitesimal things that could not be seen with microscopes. But hmm. she was able to draw extremely realistic pictures so that if you look up quarks in, on the internet, you will see that um, Annie Besson's drawings of quarks are exact replicas of what you will see today in a physics book showing quarks. Evidence that uh, the future was tugging. Well, it could be the future is tugging, or it could be that she can see things no matter how large or how small, mm. that your consciousness permeates everything. And if you ask, my, my view and actually, I had a famous psychic tell me this um, when she was looking for thermal vents in Iceland, Francis Farrelly. See, when you get to be an old man like me, I'm 87, you get to do a lot of stuff, but you also get to forget a lot of stuff. 
well how does the saying go you you know you've forgotten more than i could ever know so like it's it's just listen i'm i'm just listening intently so francis farrelly said that a experienced psychic can answer any question that has an answer so they want to know where to dig for uh thermal vents she'll tell them where to dig for thermal vents well, so uh, to get to add another example that I read about, I believe I read about it, uh, is uh, your friend Hala Hamid, who who was also a teacher of remote viewing. You guys were teaching together. She wasn't a scientist. She was a photographer. And y- you, I think you said, maybe it was in your documentary that I got it, that she was responsible for finding a pyramid in Alexandria. That's right. She did that with Stephen Schwartz. They, they found... They found buried pyramids and a buried temple. She found, he drew a picture of the buried temple where they were with stakes in the ground and described the tiles, the green tiles that they would find when they dig there, mm-hmm. dug there. So she was in a whole arduous desert trek to find a, a buried temple whose existence was known, but nobody, they've been looking for it for decades and couldn't find it. So she just walked them out into the desert and said, dig here. The first story I was telling you was about making money in the silver market. Yes. And the psychic is not able to read the numbers on the big board. So we have to do this associative remote viewing. Yep. And the way that works is that the broker in his office far away will choose four objects which are dissimilar, and we will call those, he will call those objects uh, up a little, up a lot, down a little, and down a lot. So he might choose um, a book, a cup of coffee, a vase of flowers, and his leftover pancake. Those are four objects. And I don't know anything about them at all. So here we are on Monday morning, I'm sitting with my psychic, and I say, well, uh, here we are again. I want you to describe the object that I'm going to put in your hand on Friday. Here we are Monday. On Friday, I'm going to have an object. John will bring it to me from Marin. And let's see what we can find. So we are not talking about the silver market at all. We don't want to know anything about the silver market because we don't want the current state of the silver market to fill us with foolish ideas as to what the market might be doing at the end of the week, because the market is basically random. There's nobody knows what it's going to do at the end of the week. Right. And if, if we knew at that time that the Hunt brothers were buying silver, we might have not given information that said to sell silver. So we were ignorant. The whole time we were ignorant of what silver was doing. What we would learn at the end of the each week is that Keith described the object that corresponded to what the market actually did. So I sat down with him and said, can you tell me about the surprising image that you see now? What comes to view that's surprising that corresponds to what I'm going to put in your hand next Friday? And he said, I see something sort of round and floppy and it's got a funny, disagreeable odor. And I said, well, that's a terrific description. It's very, very unique. You you can go home now. Thank you very much. And I, of course, don't know anything about the objects and I don't know anything about the market. But I then called John and said, I got a description, John. What are your objects? He said, I've got a book. I've got a jar of flowers and breakfast no yeah we 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 gave we gave him a book some flowers a coffee cup Hmm. and um a floppy pancake and he said well that floppy smelly thing that he's got sounds like my pancake leftover from lunch from breakfast and i say well what does that mean he said, well, the floppy pancake corresponds to down a lot. So based on that very sharp description, I think we'll sell $50,000 worth of silver today. Hmm. 
And it turned out, although the Hunt brothers had been buying silver, they quit buying silver. So our selling $50,000 worth of silver at that high price was a very advantageous thing to have done. We made a lot of money. And at the end of nine weeks, we made a quarter million dollars. And it's important that it's remote viewing, that we're not forecasting silver. We're forecasting the object you're going to have in your hand. Yeah, forecasting okay. silver is basically an impossible thing to do. But if I ask you to tell me what you're going to hold in your hand in four days, that's an easy thing to do. And it's called associated remote viewing. And dozens and dozens of people all over the world are now doing that. I just read a lengthy paper in the journal of a scientific journal where a guy had worked very, very hard uh, to replicate our experiment. And he changed each of the little steps just a little bit. So by the time he was all done, uh, what he had done had doesn't make any sense. That hmm. people, our, some people have replicated our work. For example, uh, this guy in Germany asked his viewer, uh, describe the card that's going to turn out to be correct. And that was very different from describe the object you're going to put in your hand. Because the word correct, because the word correct has no meaning in that category. So he basically spent a lot of time doing something that doesn't make any sense. And pe people always want to improve on what we've done, and they call that uh, replicating it, and it frequently doesn't work. Would you would you be open to uh, you and I just doing a? Uh, a small session, remote viewing session. Maybe even have the listeners join in if they want or listen in. I, I don't. I don't. Want, I've done that with you. You can describe those. Okay. Uh, so you 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 have done it with me. Uh, we've done it twice, and um, the the first time that we did it, uh, you. So I closed my eyes. You asked me to relax, and uh, you asked. Uh, you asked me to see uh, if I, I can see show you your, I can show you your object now. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Isn't that cool? Uh, you so, never got you never got you never got to see that. No, uh, and uh, it it was very close. This is the first time we did that we did it. You asked me to picture what you would be holding in your hand, what you were holding in your hand, and what popped into mind was like a small torpedo or a missile some some sort of small projectile and uh you asked me to open my eyes and you showed me a and you described that you used this adjective an illegal four inch switchblade <laughs> that's right schnapp messer schnapp messer yeah. um, I, got, I got it from Ger and from germany where they call it a schnapp messer yeah, there you go. You can hear the you can hear the switch. Uh, and then the second time we did it, uh, and I, I don't remember I don't remember the actual name of this thing. Do you remember the name? So when I I can prompt you when uh, at the time of the story. Yeah, tell me what what we did. Yeah. So what, you what kind of what asked, kind of thing did you see? Right. So you you asked me the same thing. You you held something in your hand, and uh, I said that I only saw a um something very fleeting. It appeared as a bunch of triangles, three or four oh, yeah. on one side, and then five or six on the other side, and nothing in the middle. And I said, that's the only thing I saw, but it just appeared. There yeah, there you go. So it just appeared very quickly. And I said, you know, I, I got nothing else. That's, that's it. I could, I, so we I drew it out. A, and this is a, an icosahedron. A icosahedron. That is what you the were holding 20, in your hand. Yeah. Yeah, 20 20 sided geometrical figure. Of so when you triangles. saw a lot of when you saw a lot of triangles, I was, I was already at work print <laughs> publishing your gold star. <laughs> that was incredible. I it, it, so I'm I'm gonna read something else out to you because there's a a, a friend of mine who this, is this is an, yes. you gave an exceptionally sharp description of the you said there's nothing but triangles and it's empty in the middle. 
Yes. And and this is, and if you think about it, there are very few things that, that like nothing. Well, it was very odd to me because the, the triangles just kind of seemed to be in, in, in my mind's eye were just floating. One, some on the left side, some on the right side, nothing in the middle. That's all I saw. And it was very fleeting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you were, you were impressed by it more than I was. I was just kind of surprised that it even worked. Yeah. I, I bought this because I, I have a collection of hot objects yeah. and I wanted something that was at a different trajectory from the other hot objects. I'm not going to elaborate, yep. but, I, but this is quite different from the other things that I have. In, in one word, there's not a curly line on this. Those people Thanks. like to draw circles and I wanted to get something that has absolutely no circles and P and people pick that I've now done this with a number of people. I, I've gotten pretty sensitive to what's a good target and a number of people have given, I've got lots of triangles on my cell phone now from people who have looked at that object. So, so this is another hot object. Uh, it, let, let's talk. Uh, I want. I want to talk about two more things very quickly. Uh, is I was. Um, I was sent to the fact that I wanted to read something else because a friend of mine I mentioned. A friend of mine is a, a fan of yours. I didn't know this. Uh, he was. A, he's a fan of yours. He's uh, a psychologist, and uh, he shared with me a posting. So he's affiliated also with the university. I'm not going to mention which one. It doesn't matter. But he got a posting and that he shared with me uh, very very recently very recently and this is the title of the post i'm not going to read the whole posting but this is the title nato innovation challenge on cognitive warfare nato is looking for tools and measures to identify assess and well, i don't know but what's the first word nato oh nato yeah yeah i see I, I i was hearing that from the as long as it's n-a-t-a-l no, no, yeah, sorry. That's just my, that's my accent. I apologize. Uh, NATO. A, you're not used to the Toronto accent. Um, NATO is looking for, you like that. I said NATO very clearly. <laughs> NATO is looking for tools and measures to identify, assess, and protect against attacks on NATO forces and NATO allies in the cognitive, uh, cognitive domain. Successful innovators will pitch their best solutions and tools to a panel of experts from NATO countries. This pitch style event invites non-traditional innovative thinkers from across all 30 NATO member nations to showcase ways of securing the cognitive domain against attacks, whether you work at an industry startup in academia or are part of an established <clears throat> small medium business, NATO is looking for new technologies and measures that can combat the threat of attacks on the mind. Well, one of the things that they're worried about is the so-called Cuba effect, where it appears that somebody is up is up directing high power microwaves against the brains of American embassy people. And CIA was interested in that in 1972, where they were aware that they could put <clears throat> audio modulation on a microwave beam and send that into your room from the next room and your brain would demodulate that. It would be like um, sending an AM radio signal which has audio modulation on it. You send that a signal that has, very, has speech modulated onto it that would manifest in your head as a voice in your head, which is generally undesirable. So that would be that would be a kind of a cognitive attack. And it's thought now that uh, people in Americans in Russia and in Cuba and elsewhere are getting severely damaged. And they're, they're using it's fallen into the hands of amateurs. When the CIA was doing this, they realized you did not need a lot of power uh, to communicate a message, but now they're sending so much power, they're burning up the guy's brain. And so, 
So, so maybe when you were a child, you remember the joke that crazy people were wearing tin hats yes. to protect them from the, the CIA. Well, that was a thing. That that was that that was a wise maneuver. These people were not crazy. And if you're going to be an American, work in American embassy, everyone's going to be issued uh, a tin hat, a, a football hat lined with tin foil. Amazing, amazing. Um, let, let's go back to, so I said the second thing here, uh, let's go back to Milan. We started off with Milan. I thought, you know, we just bring it, bring it back full circle. Uh, I, I told you that I, I lived a little bit in Milan. Uh, I do business in Milan. So it's, it's a city that's very, very close to my set of memories. Um, and you said you, you were teaching a class there. Do you, do you remember this story? Yeah, I had four classes that I taught in Milan and and, and outside Milan, the foothill, the Alpine foothills. Yep. And I had four, four, I did that four years and I would uh, end my week-long class, took a week because it was in Italian, so everything had to be translated. Mm -hmm. So I had all these friendly... Milanese women with their short black dresses, <laughs> bouncing around, good spirits. <laughs> and I would end my class where it was a formal double blind trial. I'm always very critical of people who teach remote viewing, but don't test it. Everybody goes away with a good feeling, but there's no data, nothing happened. So I always end my uh, workshops and trials with a formal trial uh, of the form where each of the pair of people who are working together would be given, for, re for each of them, they'd be given uh, an envelope containing a picture, and their job is to quiet their mind and describe that picture. And after they've described it, then they will open envelope number two, which contains four pictures, one of which describes the right picture. So if the person says, all I see is uh, a big X on a stand, that's all I get. And you have uh, a building, a forest, a seaside, and a windmill, uh, I would help them or their partner would help them say, well, probably you're trying to describe the windmill. So they would then bring that package to me. They would bring the drawing and all the envelopes to me. And then we would open the sealed envelope and I would see if their hidden picture, in fact, is what they drew. And so this is a formal double blind target because I don't know what the targets are, and neither do they. So double blind means that the experimenter is blind and the viewer is blind. Mm -hmm. So it's a kosher experiment. And in four, in all four of those that I did in Italy, the people were significant at three standard deviation. That is to say, with a group of 40 people, uh, 30 of them got the right answer, where you would expect only 10 of them. So this was extremely significant, especially to get four of them, four, four years worth, all three standard deviation means odds of one in a thousand. Mm -hmm. So the very, very significant. And to do four of them is breathtaking. I could get my PhD for that. So at the end of the fourth week, my fourth year, I was talking to the plenary session and said, I've been teaching this material now for 40 years. And the Italian women are the most psychic people that I ever encounter. No, I've never had a success. I've never had one successful group with all of the people I've talked to up and down Silicon Valley. Does anyone have an idea why the Italian women are so much more psychic than anybody else? And one of the women said, yeah, I know the, I know the answer to that. Everyone knows that the Italian women are the most beautiful and they're the most sexy. Why shouldn't they also be the most psychic? Of course, it's logical. 
And I thought that that was a perfectly logical idea <laughs> that the Italian women <laughs> have total permission to do whatever the hell they want to do. That they're they're free. They can just they can just they can do psychic stuff if they feel like it. Nobody's going to tell. In America, the reason there's so little ESP is it's forbidden. If mm-hmm. people say they're psychic, you think they're crazy. In Italy, if the woman wants to be psychic, she'll be psychic, just like her grandmother. You you used a, a wonderful adjective uh, describing Italian women. Do you remember that adjective? You said untrammeled. No, that's right. They're untrammeled, which was so, so apt. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. It's a, it's a very Italian story. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, the most beautiful, yeah. most sexy, and most psychic. It, it's, uh, listen, it's uh, very logical to me. It's very logical to you. I don't think that you The only any- other group that I found doing as well as the Italian women from Milan is the American group who are professional dowsers. The dowsers from the American Society of Dowsers. There's a bunch of old guys who show up in their bib top overalls. And, and and what are dowsers? What do they do? Dowsers looks for water. They wa- they have they have the cross sticks yeah, right, and they okay. wander around looking for water and they do that for a living. So you don't get to be an old dowser unless you're actually able to do it. And they and they were they were uh, at least as good as the Italian women. Okay, so I'm 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 going to interject them with this because I said speaking with Italians, my father-in-law um who's actually very near the end uh, uh of his life unfortunately um i've known him for 25 years uh, he's he was a builder by trade uh and he's built uh, he's had lots of projects over the last 30 40 years and one of the f- one of the first things he showed me i i was a i was a man boy i don't know it was in my early 20s whatever the hell i was um, we were on his property and he was trying to find a water main and he just took two branches on the, uh, on the ground on, on his lawn and he put them together. So what are you, what are you doing? He goes, well, this is how you find water. Go, what? <laughs> what? So, good and, for him. and he did it and he found the water source. I said, oh, that's crazy. You knew where that water source was. No, I didn't know that water source. Why do you think of you? I said, okay, uh, is there another water source on this property? I want to try it. And I did it. And it worked. And so when you said dowser to me uh, last week, I don't know what a dowser is. I looked it up. I go, what? People rub sticks together, find water. And it, it just, I would have forgotten that story forever if you hadn't said dowser to me. And that was my own, first and only experience with it. And it, my father-in-law is not one who believes in anything that you and I have just spoken about. <laughs> so he's a skeptic to, I mean, to the end. And here he was showing me this. And you're saying that dowsers, I mean, your explanation is that dowsers do this for a living. That's right. <laughs> they, 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 find, they, find, they find water, basically. Um, uh, Russell, we're, 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 coming to, we're coming to an end in this conversation, unfortunately. I, I, I promised you uh, less time than what we've taken already. So I, I, I'm doubly appreciative here. Uh, let well, me ask- I could mention one other thing. Oh, I, have yeah, a yeah, chapter, I have a chapter in my book. You've asked me a number of times how you learn remote viewing. Yes. And I've given you the answer. But if you really want further information, I have a chapter in my book on how to work with a partner. I don't tell you I don't tell you how to find a friend. You've got to find a friend by yourself. But if if you're so fortunate as to find a friend, you and that person can help each other develop your psychic ability by doing very simple tests together on a uh, scale of increasing difficulty. And before you know it, you're going to be uh, an experienced remote viewer. Well, uh, so I'm very interested in finding that. So I have two of your books here. Which book are you referring to? The Autobiography or The Reality of ESP? Reality of ESP. Uh, okay, so it's in, it's in this chapter. And so you know what we'll do? We'll put it in the show notes. That's so I, I'm not going to look for it here while we're on the recording. Okay, it's just toward, toward the end of the book. Okay. We'll put it in the show notes for, for the listener. Uh, Russell, uh, what, um, what does greatness mean to you? Greatness pertains to a person's ability to expand and develop their innate capabilities for 
their own benefit, the benefit of mankind. Great person. You don't become great because you've made a billion dollars. It doesn't make you great. It makes you a, a great jerk frequently. But if you can use your ability in a way that actually is helpful to the society, then there's an opportunity for greatness. I, I would say that I, I've developed the, I've devoted the last 50 years of my life to helping people get in touch with their psychic abilities and show them the psychic abilities are available and that it's a path, an experience that a person can have that shows that there is more to them than meat and potatoes, that they can take part in this timeless awareness, which I believe is their nature. <clears throat> At no cost, it's available. And I encourage you to get in touch with that. You know, it's uh, it's not lost on me that you are um, you're an individual, you're an ex you have an extraordinary set of stories and the journey uh, of your life. And it's not lost on me that uh, a man uh, who is legally uh, visually impaired, who has <laughs> ridden a motor or who rode a motorcycle for 35 years, <laughs> regardless, uh, but a man with that uh, uh, that impairment is a man who has seen so much more than anybody else. And that man has spent uh, his lifetime helping people to see. Uh, it, it's, 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 um, it's simply beautiful. And uh, Russell, thank you so very much for all of your time, even before this record. Well, thank you, it's been a pleasure, been a pleasure chatting with you, opening new vistas. <laughs> Uh, and I look forward to opening so much more. Thank you, Russell. Bye-bye. Right. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today, there's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>